What's up, y'all? Today we're sitting down with my buddy Paul Barbo. He's a member of my mastermind and specializes in underwriting apartments, especially underwriting apartments in changing economies with changing interest rates and changing markets. So we're gonna dive deep into how he's underwriting, how he used to underwrite, how he's underwriting right now, and how he expects to underwrite moving forward. Let's go match up with Paul. Paul, what's up, dude? How's it going, Tim? Dude, good to have you here, man. So welcome to Charleston. Uh, we got to grab some coffee, spend some time together the other day. Appreciate yeah. that. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, excited that you're, you know, creating a course for Legacy Wealth Academy, all about underwriting apartments. Yeah, multifamily underwriting. So let's share a little bit about your story. I heard some of it, but yeah. let's talk a little bit about how how did you get into owning apartment buildings, and uh, and then we'll dive into kind of the underwriting, we'll talk, some of the deals that you've done, and yeah. I want to hear like how has that transitioned and changed, and how you look at apartment buildings today versus some of the ones that you bought earlier on. So how'd you get, how'd you get started as a real estate investor? So I, um, actually my family had real estate growing up. They had some rental properties, commercial buildings, houses. Uh, my dad had a construction company. He built some uh, duplexes in town and, um, and they, they managed that stuff when I was growing up. Slowly sold them off as I got older. It was a pain in the butt for them. They uh, managed all the, all that stuff themselves and you know worst nightmare stories you can imagine but uh for whatever reason i still decided that i i wanted to own some rental properties when i was older got you know i got a went to college got a job uh I went to college for civil engineering was a construction project manager and um so started, it's good you, you got the you got the engineering the analytical mindset right coming yeah. into this yeah, right. With Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah, and then and then you become a construction manager uh -huh. for a firm. Yep. And then what was that like? Uh, it was stressful. It was uh, long hours. I learned that I hate managing contractors. Mm -hmm. um, I don't love doing that. And so, I also thought I, maybe I wanted to start f to flip houses and flip houses and have that income by my rental properties. And so that was what was going through my head as as I was thinking about actually exiting my job. But um, so I. I took some beginner real estate courses, started to get my feet wet, started just taking like baby steps into um, whatever my first deal was going to be. I found a, a duplex. So I was kind of went first thing was multifamily. It was yeah. a duplex in, uh, in Lexington, North Carolina, a little small town. Okay. Found it off Craigslist. Um, bought it straight from the owner. It wasn't like a broker or anything. But it worked out great because the owner was actually like my mentor. Um, she was this lady and she'd been investing for a long time and, uh, bought it from her and she was like, tell me, I was like, oh, like I'm having a problem. I could reach out to her. Hey, I'm having a problem with this. I need to find a new tenant. And she would tell me exactly what to do. So yeah. I got this built in mentor right there. And, um, and that was great. Yeah. Um, it's not like when you're flipping a house, you're buying a house from somebody who's an owner occupant that actually lived there. Uh -huh. Typically like there's no ongoing connection or, or relationship there, right? Yep. But when you buy investment property from other investors or sell investment property to other investors, mm -hmm. there's this organic network that kind of comes to be yep. where you're able to communicate with them, stay in touch with them. They might sell something in the future yes. and be a private money investor of yours. They might look to sell something in the future to you. They might look to buy something in the future from you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of different ways where you can continue that relationship and keep on doing business with those people. So like yeah. early on, I just, I did, I kept a simple Excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. of everybody that I ever met. Like you get all these business cards yep, and I just yep. throw their name in an Excel spreadsheet, like first name, last name, and then I put their phone number in, mm -hmm. their email address and any notes that I recall like conversation, hey, they bought this property from me or they inquired on this property or they sold this property to so-and-so. And, -so. and I, uh, And I would hang on to their contact information and then that list, created uh, or ended up, ended up becoming my email database, my email list. And so I'd start emailing everybody saying, hey, I'm, I just sold something. I'm looking to buy a property. Mm -hmm. Hey, I just, uh, I have this property. I'm about to sell it. If you're interested or you know anybody who's interested, might be interested in buying it. Or I'm looking to bring on capital for this, this investment or looking for a hard money loan or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And then I would send that out to that email list. And because a seller is a buyer, 
is a private money lender. Whenever yeah. you're, you're building any one of those buckets, mm -hmm. you're building all three of those buckets. Totally. You know, because like I'm buying and selling and investing in deals at all times. It's just kind of a timing piece. So yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah. I love that story about her. Yeah. So she's mentoring you. You yeah. got a duplex. Uh -huh. Now what? So my next. Um, so it was it was going all right. I did some repairs to that place, and um, actually I kept the the same two tenants were actually in there uh, until I decided to sell it. So. Actually, I moved back to that. I lived in North Carolina, moved back to Nashville. I bought a primary residence. And by this time, I'd kind of figured out you need to find a good deal. It needs to be a little ugly. Yeah, it needs. And you need to find it. I was finding stuff off Craigslist. So I bought that deal off Craigslist. And what is this? What year? 2015, 16. Yeah, there was a lot of shit on so Craigslist, Craigslist back then. I was, I was <laughs> selling some shit on Craigslist. Yeah, yeah. You know I can't mean. believe you didn't buy any of my shit. I know. I probably saw you on there, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, bought a house off Craigslist that was that was a rental property. Yeah. Same way, just dealt with the owner. Um, he had a tenant in there, and um, it it wasn't it wasn't in bad shape. It smelled like cigarette smoke. Like you walked in there, and you know, like a week after the the tenant moved out, you could like you know still have to like wave Ye your hand to see yellow the smoke. ceilings, yeah, yellow, yellow walls, ceilings. Yeah. yeah, carpets were yellow and everything. Um, so yeah, I bought that, and then sometime in there, I was hating my job. And I, um, you know, I had some equity in my in my properties then, and I thought, well, if I uh, sold both of these properties, I can live uh, in a box yeah. or under a bridge if I had to, yeah. and pay. You know, I can eat, I can, um, you know, buy gas and all this stuff until I can find my next project, right? Which I thought was going to be flipping. I thought I was going to flip houses, and so what I did was I sold the house, sold the duplex. Moved in with my parents, went all in in real estate, job was quit, and um, that was when I hit the doldrums, which was I, I was I was learning, I was making baby steps, I was living with my parents, I was in a, I was actually like, I started to get in like a really bad like headspace because I never found like my next deal. I like, oh, found this house that I wanted to flip, but I'm like, oh, it's a lot of work, and I don't really know how to do it, and. I don't really know how to, um, you know, figure the uh, costs to buy it. And all these people are like, all the good deals, you had to have cash money. To, you had to have cash to buy them. Yep. I don't have cash. I didn't know what hard money was at the time. I was afraid to, you know, go and borrow some high interest loan for a short period of time. But, um, and I, so, I, so I had my own multifamily. I wanted to, uh, at this point, so I was like, well, maybe I'll buy like a fourplex or maybe even like an eightplex because I had like $100,000 in cash that needed to go somewhere. And I was also living, I was living on like $15,000 a year. So I wasn't yeah. spending much of it, but it was going away. Yeah. And what I did was I started writing handwritten notes to my little farm area of multifamily, which was around uh, where I grew up in a small town in Tennessee. So I had maybe 40 different property owners writing them a handwritten letter uh once a, a month hey if you ever want to sell your property let me know here's my name whatever here's my contact information somebody gave me a call said i have a i've got a 30 something unit portfolio that i want to sell would you be interested in that and i was like no i really just wanted that eight plex but um and he said well let's go have lunch sometime i got a broker friend that i want to introduce you to and that broker found this next deal which was a did a, you buy that eight plex from that guy no i didn't okay but the broker found me a 32 unit complex that was like a mile from where I grew up. And he said, this guy wants to um, do some owner financing on it. And I was like, ding, ding. Cause I'd heard that, you know, if you can get the owner to finance part of the purchase price and get the bank to finance the rest of it, you don't have to have a 20% down payment. By the way, this yeah. is a $1.15 million purchase. Yep. And I had about a hundred thousand dollars. So, I was like, if I can do like 10% down on this thing, I can, like, I can do it. Scared to death. And how many units is it? 32. 32? Absolutely scared me to death. I'm borrowing a million dollars. Like, yeah. I, to this point, like, you know, I've borrowed like $120,000 on a yeah. house or whatever, $50,000 on a duplex. But this is like, holy crap, I'm scared. Like, what if stuff goes wrong? All this stuff. But... And at the time, I was working a construction job for my cousin, literally manual labor construction, um, like 
with a master's degree, which is like, you know, very humbling experience. Sure. But, uh, while, you know, I was in the, we all need to go through that a little bit, dude. I was, I was, I, I got, a, I had a degree, it's, I had a, a roof, a roof leak at one of the properties. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. It was a metal roof. I was, uh, especially I'm from uh, Ohio. So uh, I'm here in South Carolina. There's a metal roof. I, I went to the store and I got tinfoil and I put it on and I fucking tarred over it. And that's I not how that, I fix stuff. That's too, how I fix stuff. Like early I, don't, on. I like to think was, that I can fix things. The ultimate I, dumbass. Yeah. And so anyway, I'm, I'm on the construction site one day and we get the appraisal back. I get the appraisal back looking at my phone and it was $180,000 more than what I was going to buy it for. And I was like, oh my God. Cha-ching. I just made $180,000. Yeah. Working along, and I'm looking at these guys that I'm working alongside. They're living paycheck to paycheck, making thirty grand a year, and I'm like, "Oh my! Like this is yeah. crazy, absolutely mind blowing at the time." Equity rich landlord now, huh? Yeah, and so, and I was like, "If this thing I, is true, if this appraisal rings true, then you know, dude, this it, is absolutely wonderful." And leading to that point, I, I, you said something earlier that I think is really important. Is like, dude, ninety percent of our time in business and the shit that we do, maybe more than 90, is just like a waste of time, right? Like you contacting that guy and he's like, no, I'm not interested in selling, never led to a deal. Mm -hmm. But it led to another relationship. Yep. And you never know what that butterfly effect can be of what path it leads you down to then all of a sudden, boom, all those things were worth a lot of time. And I wouldn't even have this contact unless I wasted my time with sending letters to all 40 Right, the other thirty-nine didn't even call you back. That I don't, maybe they did, but mm -hmm. that one who did still didn't even buy a deal from. But it led you down this path yep. of almost breadcrumbs to somebody who could bring you a deal. And so it's like you got to put in the actions, you got to do the activities, yes. you got to uh, you know put forth the effort on a continuous basis because you don't know yep. what it's going to end up leading to. Right? It's like yeah. maybe it's not that, maybe it's not even the next person, but then somehow down the road it leads you to somebody who can bring you deals, who can bring you money, who can be a yep. joint venture partner, somebody, right, that, yep. that then creates an opportunity that then blossoms for you. So I think yep. that's a really important piece because we feel like we're just treading water and yep. swimming upstream all the time, but it, like it's working under the surface. Like those relationships and that, that trail starts being created and the organic um, growth that happens from that I think is really, really uh, important to understand that it is working underneath the surface. Yep. So, uh, you get the 32 unit, you put up a hundred grand down. Yep. He seller financed the entire rest of it. Uh, he seller financed, it was like 35%. And then I think, uh, 65% or 55% was from the bank. Okay. And then the 10 came from me and I borrowed a little money from my parents to like yep. buy, you know, groceries and stuff and all yeah. that stuff until I could. Yeah. Um, I, I'm putting this money down. I can't, I can't pay rent or groceries. Broke anymore. after yeah. that. Yeah. Completely broke. But I was like, it's gonna cash flow. So the appraisal comes in. Yep. Cash flow is positive. How much? So the way I had it underwritten, it was gonna cash flow like twenty to twenty five thousand dollars a year, which was more than what you were making, or about what you were making in your construction job, right? No, I was making more than that, but I was like, I could. I think I was making like seventy five k when I quit, but I was like, pretty I've got good. This, I've got the equity, and I can still like, I can live on thirty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. For now. Yeah. Until you know, other things happen. Like so that's when you rolled out on the job. No, I'd already quit my job. Oh, you had. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. I was. I quit my job, moved in with my parents, and like. But I thought you were working uh, manual construction. Oh, I was. I was. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was. Yeah, the construction job was like thirty thousand a year. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My. Not so my, did you quit that then? Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So you you, you quit. Yeah, no, yeah but, I know. Yeah, quit the construction <laughs> job for sure. <laughs> so yeah. you quit that before or after you bought the property. Uh, like right before I bought it. Okay, perfect. Then you buy the property, Not coming appraisal in. comes in. I assume you self-managed that apartment building? I uh, kept the manager, uh, the, the previous owner had a manager and a maintenance man, husband and wife team, and they managed that property and another one. And so I just kept them on uh, for mine. Yeah. And yeah. Then I ended love up it. getting some professional management. Yeah, dude, you got that. to. Right, like if you don't have professional management, if you don't have like real reporting, right? Like, I don't know. I remember having a realtor mm -hmm. that was like, oh yeah, I want to I want to manage a property. I was like, okay, well, like, what does the reporting look like? She goes, like, I send you an Excel spreadsheet with mm -hmm. how much money came in every single month and uh, this and that. And, like there, there wasn't any like 
real reports that you could press yeah. a button and see a balance sheet or a profit and loss statement or yeah. a trailing 12, you know, or anything along those lines. So yeah. that, that to me was like a, a red flag of like, yeah. I can't, if you don't have manage, if you don't have numbers and metrics, then you can't manage it, right? Yeah. You, you can't manage what you can't measure. And it's easy. It's just a software. They get a software, right. pay a fee and it makes their life easier, makes your life easier. So, so we buy a 32 unit. What was your yeah. next building? Uh, it was an eight unit. An eight unit. And then you bought? 57 unit. 57 unit. And, uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, you've transacted, you've sold some of those, right? Yep. Kept some of them, refinanced some of them, pulled some equity out of some of them. Um, and you have a, a couple hundred storage units now too, right? Yep. So today, uh, 160 storage units, Northern Alabama and then 96 apartments in Southern Kentucky. So let's talk about how do you underwrite, how, what differed from what you were underwriting and how you were underwriting maybe back then mm -hmm. to then how you started underwriting these and, and how you're underwriting now. And then also I wanna hit on how has the market changed? And as the market continues to change, how does the underwriting continue to change, right? Because you're yeah. not uh, underwriting deals the same way Nope. with interest rates rising as you did 18 months ago, right? Yep, yep. So let's talk a little bit about the underwriting process. What are the things that you need from a seller to even begin underwriting a property? Uh, rent roll, if you can get 12. What's a rent roll? <laughs> uh, the units and how much rent they're paying. So it's a unit mix, how many one bedrooms, two bedrooms, yep, three bedrooms. The mix. And then how, many, how much they're paying in rent. The rent, when their lease started, when their lease expires. Um, all that data. And sometimes if you're getting it from a mom and pop, you're going to get a list of names and a list of rents. Yep. And uh, maybe maybe they'll have the deposits on there. Maybe they won't. Uh, if they've been there a long time, maybe they won't even have a lease for those people. Yeah. Um, so I run into that a lot. So what do you do if they're like, oh, it's mom and pop and here's here's the back of the napkin. You know, these these 15 tenants, they, mm -hmm. they all pay this much. This one unit's vacant. Uh, yep. But it should be eight hundred dollars a month, mm -hmm. and they just give you that for the list. Like, uh, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, so I guess um, I always look at it as well. I'm like, I, and I look at the property, of course, and then I look at um, the rent comps in the area. So I'm like, I'm not, it's, I'm not going to keep it the same way it is now, right? I'm going to do improvements. I'm going to make it look pretty. I'm going to get um, the nicest tenant base that I can into this building with, you know. Uh, reasonable repairs to the property, um, even something that just simple as like a nice paint job and new flooring. Wham, bam, you got to get $200 rent premium. So I'm looking at the comparables. And so I don't really, even if they don't give me good financials, like now I have the experience and I can, I can say, how am, how am I going to run this property? And you know, what is my rent roll going to be like? I think that's future? such a critical piece, dude, because so many people, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with it on um, took over operations on a property that the joint venture partner isn't running it very well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm entertaining some offers and people hit me up. They're like, well, what's the cap rate right now? Like, what's the cap rate? I was like, it's a value add property. Like it's, it's, it's in the process. And I had to take this thing over. Mm -hmm. It needs a little bit more capital improvements. It needs some lease up in order to get it up to the 94% occupancy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's in that process. Well, what's the cap rate right now? It's like, dude, if you flipped a house, do you care about what it looks like today or what you can sell it for and what it looks like in six months once it's fully renovated? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, I care about what it's worth later. Yeah. So let's look at what are those market rate rents, right? So you're, you're looking at what it can be, not what it is today. And so you're looking at uh, where, do you, where do you get your market rate rents from? Um... Sometimes Zillow um, or other like apartments.com. Yeah. You know, just Google search. You're looking up other stuff in the area though. Yeah. Within a certain, you know, parameter. Yeah, hopefully close by. If it's less than a mile, the same vintage apartments, whatever. You know, you can't compare your A-class stuff to your C-class stuff. That's a good point. Um, yeah, it's not apples to apples. You got to make sure you're, you're, you're comparing apples. That's apples to oranges. You got to make sure you're comparing apples to apples with, yep. uh, you know, if you got a 70s vintage apartment, at you know 900 square feet how much are they getting in rent versus mm -hmm. uh you know some a plus that's that 
doesn't matter. Like that's inconsequential to what this apartment could rent for. Making yep. sure the amenities, right, yep. are similar, similar. comparable. Yep. Is there parking? Is it more of a townhouse where they pull right up and they can walk in with groceries? Or do they have to park, walk down a path, go up two stories in order to then go into their apartment? There's a mm. lot of different components that can change some of that stuff that I found. Yep. But I'm looking, one of the websites we've used is Rentometer, R-E-N-T-O-M-E-T-E-R. Mm. So rentometer.com is a, is a website that we've used. And I don't know, do you ever like drive for dollars or like just look up, you know, apartments available and then just start clicking and seeing what's available in the area? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's yeah. an easy way uh, to figure that out. Another thing that I've done in, in the past is I contact management companies uh -huh. in the area and say, hey, I'm thinking about buying this. Can you give me some feedback? How is it to lease in this area? Yeah. Like they can't tell you what the demographic is, that right. there's fair yeah. housing laws and stuff yeah, around yeah. that. And so they won't tell me that, but they'll tell you how easy it is to lease. Yeah. Oh yeah. Those 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 will fly off those the shelf. Fly off the shelves. Or maybe three bedrooms in this area aren't uh, taking yeah, yeah. longer or something like that. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. And so that way you can get some feedback on you know how how much demand there is and what they would rent it for as well. Yeah. So a couple ideas on on how to figure out what the that's great yeah. what the uh, rent could be. So now that I know the income or what the income potential is yep. what about expenses? What if the seller doesn't give you any data <laughs> on expenses, right? Like, yep, yep, no, that's great too. Um, well, there's, no, there's no management fee here. Like I, I self-manage, so it's- Yeah, it's, no there's, management fee. Yeah. Um, Taxes. Repairs. Insurance, 5, utilities. 5,000 a month for a 50 unit. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. You're like, if, you're, yeah. if that's actually happening, yeah. that's why this place looks like it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so uh, taxes, you can look that up. I'll always, if I'm looking at a deal, um, if you can't find it on like the city and county website, uh, I'll usually call and say, hey, um, in the tax rates, sometimes are kind of hard to figure out, like, oh, it's so-and-so per $100. So I'm just like, hey, I'm looking to buy on this property. Here's a purchase price, $1 million. What are my taxes going to be, and when who, is it going to reset? Who are you calling? Uh, the county and the city. You're calling the county auditor. Was that the county you're, auditor? Yeah, you're calling the county auditor, right? In order yeah. to figure that out. And then so yep. the count so you'll just pick up the phone and actually call them and yeah. then say, Hey, I'm looking to I, I love that. Um, because we're always trying to figure it out and like I'm you know, looking at the um shit, what do they call like the uh I don't fucking know. Anyways, well, but but sometimes it's like a four percent assessment, sometimes it's uh -huh. a six percent assessment, depending on the city, sometimes there's municipal taxes in addition to the county or yep, yep, uh, yep. state or whatever else. And like, there's a lot of different components uh, that can come into that or that can play a variable in that. And yes. one of which, the biggest one of which is values have gone like this. Mm -hmm. And so now these reassessments are yep. occurring. So uh, you'll ask them how often they, they reassess. How often does that typically happen? Or mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to have to guess it. So. I love that you just straight up ask them, when, when's yeah. a reassessment going to occur? Yep. Yeah, they're usually very helpful to see, oh, it's going to be in uh, 2026. I did have one one time. They said, well, it's usually every four years, but sometimes if someone else, if someone at the state finds out that it's sold, they'll look at it. And, but it turned out it was it was on the date that they promised that it would be. But um, so, it's, yeah, your taxes... So you can find that. Because sometimes that's triggered by a sale occurring. Yeah, sometimes it's a sale. It might be every four years, but if there is a sale actually occurred, then they would do it the following year and your taxes yep. would jump up. And one of the big yep. things is make sure you're underwriting for that tax increase. Because yep. if Definitely. you don't, it will adversely affect the, the, the value yep. by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Yep, yep. So uh, love that hack on taxes. Yep. So taxes, what about insurance? Uh, call your insurance broker and say, "Here's what I'm looking at." They'll get you a quote. Sometimes the same day. But what about what about just going off the seller's insurance? <laughs> yeah, well, they had it um, insured for uh, fifty percent of uh, actual cash value. <laughs> ACV, or whatever. yeah. And, uh, so you don't know. Yeah, you don't know that. You don't know what their you know what their coverages and all that stuff yeah. are. But so you want to talk to your agent and say, "Here's what I you know. Here's what I have." And then make sure there's no coverage gaps. Maybe they're going to put, uh, you know, a different kinds of liability. And so if you go that, off so. of if you go off the seller's insurance, they might have the wrong insurance, right? Yeah. Like, I I was looking at a property to buy, 
And the seller's like, oh no, here's the insurance. He's my guy. He's amazing. Mm -hmm. I gave it to my insurance guy, Drew McConaughey. Mm -hmm. And Drew looks at it. He's like, an insurance company would never pay out on this, right? <laughs> they have they have aluminum wiring, and they, here it says that they have Romax, mm -hmm. right? It says the roofs were redone in the are brand new. These roofs haven't been done in 22 years. You know, yeah. like like if there's a if there's a claim, Tim, like if you go with that policy. You're like, like the claim will never ever get paid out. You're lighting insurance. You might as well just not have insurance, right? Yeah. Because it wouldn't pay out. So making sure you have the right coverage, the right insurance in place mm -hmm. for that property, that vintage, the age of the property, the type of the wiring, the age of the roof, all that kind of stuff, um, and making sure you have the right policy in place. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the other thing it does is both of those things, taxes and insurance, you can take the quote to the seller and say, hey, you got bad insurance in place. You're trying to sell me something that yep. you know, doesn't have real, uh, a real insurance value. Yep. You can yep. sh give them that quote and you can also tell them what the, what the tax assessor's office told you about yep. a reassessment and what that's gonna do to the property value. Mm -hmm. So yep. Yep. I love it, man. Uh, taxes, insurance, how about utilities? Uh, so you need to know if, yeah, if the owner's paying any or all utilities, um, and then the second question is, are they submetered? So I bought a property, one of my 48 units in Kentucky. Um, the previous owner was paying all the electric bills. There's separate electric meters. So ding, ding. All right. First thing I'm going to do is get them to pay their own electric bill. That's a um, value add component right there. Yeah. That yeah. was a total expense play. The rent, when I bought it, I knew the rents would probably stay the same. But I knew I could get those expenses like twenty thousand dollars a year just in electric bills immediately to where I don't have to pay them. Yeah, um, and that that uh, impacts the net operating income just yeah. as much as increasing rents. Correct. You yep. can raise rents by twenty thousand dollars a year and keep it's the expenses the same, or keep the income the same and reduce expenses by twenty thousand. Both of them equally impact the bottom line, the net operating income, which substantially uh, you know, increases the value of the property. It yep. gives it a multiple on that yep. that yep. increases the value. And it's not always about raising rents. A lot mm -hmm. of times it's about reducing the expenses in some capacity. Yep, yep. And so, um, yeah, figure out who's doing that. If, uh, you know, a lot of times you may only have one water meter for the property. Uh, this one only has one water meter, one gas meter. Um, so you need the bills. You need the bills from those to be able to see yep. how much they're using, um, and not just this month's bill. Yeah, twelve months. You know, you, you need, need another all winter, twelve summer. Months. Yeah, all that Beca because of the seasonality, right? Yep. Like I, I got started up in Cleveland, Ohio, buying apartment buildings, and guess what? The heat bill is through the friggin' roof in the winter time, yeah. and then it's almost non-existent. So if you just go off of hey, you're trying to buy something in September. Mm -hmm. And they give you the past three months of, uh, of bills. And you're like, oh, hey, the, uh, the gas bill here is only $250 a month. Mm -hmm. And then you close on the property, you roll into the winter time, and it ends up being $1,800 a month those other yep. few months. Dude, it's because you didn't do your due diligence and you didn't underwrite the property the right way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so water bill, yep. you get 12 months of that. Gas bill, electric bill. Yep. Uh, what about like trash? Yep. You need to get your, uh, if they're using a dumpster company, maybe there's only two or three different companies you can get quotes from, but you know, figure out how many times they're dumping it per week. We give it two dumpsters. Is it one dump per week or is it like three dumps per week? Yep. And, um, and you can kind of, sometimes you can ask the, the residents, does this thing ever get full? If it's overflowing on yep. the day before it's supposed to get dumped, maybe you need to. Three, uh, three times a week or whatever. Yep. So call and get quotes for that. Uh, your lawn care as well. Uh, they probably had uh, some guy on a broken down lawnmower yep. uh, mowing the grass every now and again. Uh, you can do that, but we like to get a professional, uh, you know, they'll come and cut, trim, uh, do edging and blow and everything yep. and make it look really nice. Dude, that, and, that's, and that's one of those things, like people, you don't want a job when you're buying an apartment building. You're buying a business. So mm -hmm. let's run it like a business. Let's yep. get a professional third parties in there. Yep. I understand trying to keep costs low, trying to do it, but like just run it properly because you're going to be spending less time worried about $15 an hour problems as opposed yep. to 
focusing on $1,000 an hour problems and solving those. And guess what? You get paid in accordance to doing each of those things. Yep. So if you're worried about you know, policing the landscaper who, who pushes his lawnmower down the street two blocks in order to cut your grass and has no other tools versus just getting a landscaping company to come in and you might pay them 20% more, 30% more, but they do everything. It looks mint as soon as it's done, every single time. You don't have to double check. You don't have to police it. Dude, every single time I'd go with a professional landscaping company. You yep. got to do it. If you, want a, if you want a real business, if you want some joke of a property, then hire the jokers. Right? But if you want a real quality company and a quality business, then hire quality third-party vendors. Yep, yep. Okay. Taxes, insurance, utilities. Maintenance. Uh, maintenance. Yep. Set on maintenance. What are we looking at there? So I don't really have a great... There's rules of thumb. Some people say, yeah, don't use their number because you don't... <laughs> Who knows, that, who that's knows what, what they're that's, doing, but. That's the only rule of thumb that really matters, right? Don't use the stated number. Don't use their number, but yeah. definitely, um, so if you're getting, so right now my 248 unit properties, actually when I bought the first one, I had a full-time maintenance person and a full-time manager, which was, it was good at first, um, because it was all, all hands on deck at that one property that needed a lot of help. Now, uh, I don't know, rule of thumb, uh, half of a, or one maintenance man per 100 units, or maintenance person, one manager per 100 units. And yep. So now it's, I kind of got a perfect setup because I have 96, 30 minutes down the road from each other. And so you need to kind of, and you need to talk to your your management company because mine, I pay them a fee. We didn't even talk about management fee. Well, we're going to go uh, to the management We'll look back into that. So, um, so you need to have, okay, what is the maintenance person's salary going to be? And so now it's half of that goes to one property, half of it goes to the other. And then how much is your are your maintenance costs actually going to be? Well, do you have, um, are all of your water heaters from 1980 and all of your air conditioners from 1980, uh, you know, is stuff kind of falling apart or is it in really good condition? And you really kind of need to estimate that on your own. Um, and sometimes it's, it's hard to estimate it, but... Yeah. What you do need to know is if you're doing repairs, it's, and some, some of it's like capital expenditures and repairs, they, there's a gray area there, but if you're doing repairs, it's going to be good for putting a water heater in. Good. Good for 10 years. Yep. You don't have to worry about that. So yeah. So, so typically expenses, rule of thumb, talk to your CPA and all that shit, right? Rule of thumb though is you can expense something if it's done on an annual basis, mm -hmm. right? Or less than 12 months. Mm -hmm. If it's more than 12 months or, you know, you don't have to do it every single year, um, then that's something that's capitalized, right? Mm -hmm. And so that yep, gets depreciated go. over time. So a, a water heater, a roof. Um, HVAC. Yeah, HVAC, concrete work, things like that are capitalized expenses. Uh, if things like trash and things like landscaping and things like maybe turning a unit and painting mm -hmm. that a lot of that stuff can be expensed because it's done that's regular recurring maintenance yeah. you know replacing out the carpet in the common area is potentially mm -hmm. uh, depends on how often you do that right and so that's kind of the the ballpark there but dude for us early on it was let's let me put as little work into this thing as possible mm -hmm. and just get it online right like that was and then there were a lot of random shit that would go wrong random mm -hmm. stuff that oh no like i got a, a six thousand dollar expense this month because the boiler needed a bunch of work yep. or you know the stairs went out or you know i don't know wh whatever the hell it was and then once i realized if i want a real business i should treat this like a real business right mm -hmm. and and front end load a lot of those capital improvements that i know i'm going to take care of over the course of time mm -hmm. it does a few things one is way easier to raise money right at the beginning when you're getting all the money for the deal anyways uh -huh. and loading in those capital improvements at that time. Um, and secondly, it just attracts better tenants because now you have a nice property that then attracts better tenants and it's easier to raise and bump up rents on existing mm -hmm. tenants and then it creates predictable maintenance schedule, right? If you go in and you put LVT tile in all the all the units and then you know you update all the cosmetic light fixtures and hardware mm -hmm. and you paint everything and um, you update the kitchens and the bathrooms. Now you have predictable maintenance schedules versus 
you put in a little, as little as possible right out of the gate, a tenant turns over, and then that unit turn doesn't cost you $1,500. Instead, it costs you ten to $12,000, you know? Mm-hmm. And it totally throws off your cash flow. Yep. You can have much more predictable cash flow if, if you have, do more of the maintenance and more of the capital improvements on the front end. At least that's yeah. how I found it. Yeah, yeah. So, well, what, what would be your rule of thumb uh, per unit per month or something like that for maintenance? If we're plugging in a number, well, I, if we don't know it, yeah. So, know. so there's there's a couple of components. Is, um, you know, if the if the if you have a hundred unit building, yeah. then that maintenance person's salary we put on on maintenance. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is the lender, depending on who you have, is going to mm. require some sort of a maintenance reserve to yep. be set aside. So yeah. at least the agency lenders, maybe not the, the local banks, mm-hmm. but they typically say 250 per unit per year, the they want set aside in the reserves, which is like 20 bucks per unit per month. Uh, but that, that, that's not really enough to take care of serious improvements. So yeah, yeah. we ballpark, I think, I think around 8% of what the gross potential rents, gross potential income Got it. is. So okay. if we're going to make a million bucks a year, Gross on a property, it's called a hundred. Yeah, it's about eighty thousand okay. dollars. Is is about, but that that should include salary. That could should include any sort of like the, uh, um, you know, maintenance supplies yeah. and then some of that, some of that kind of stuff. So yeah. and maybe some third party type things. Yeah. Uh, about it's it's yeah, generally the around there. Big, you have a big sewer clog. Your guy can't do it. Got to have to call yeah. Rotor River. Yeah. And and you know and some. Sometimes, depending on who does the bookkeeping, could put the different line items for different things. And mm-hmm. you know, if I'm consolidating all the maintenance stuff, I don't know. I'd say probably around eight to eight percent. But it also depends, like you said, like I don't know, are these townhomes mm-hmm. or that are that are new construction, or is yeah. this a hundred year old apartment building in Cleveland, Ohio? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that has a boiler system and yeah. and has hundred year old walls and hundred year old plumbing and hundred year old you know everything else. Or is it something that's you know '90s, '80s vintage that maybe mm-hmm. in the middle? Uh, it just kind of depends on the asset itself. Obviously, yep. the older stuff uh, is going to need a little bit more attention and a little bit more maintenance, mm-hmm. and the newer stuff is going to need a lot less. Yep, yep. So, what about management? Like, what do you look for whenever you're underwriting for property management? And so, um, I've actually only ever used one management company. They've been great to me so far. So. Um, and all your stuff's pretty local. Yeah, it's all right? within a, an hour radius. Everything I've really ever owned, the the larger stuff is within like an hour radius of Nashville, Tennessee, and that's where they're out of. And so, um, uh, first thing is five percent of gross income is uh, goes to them yep. for you know everything overhead, and that's the fee and everything. So five percent of gross income, you pay the uh, manager's salary. So and the manager's salary, the property manager and the maintenance person's salary yep. are an expense on the property, uh-huh. right? And so that's not the management company's responsibility. That is the property owner's responsibility to take on that salary. Yep. Are they, is their salary billed to the property, but they're on payroll for Correct. the management company? Yep. That's yeah, how yeah. it's worked with all, almost yeah, they all third-party Yeah, they bill me us. every month with a line item for, okay, so if you're paying Sounds the maintenance good. guy, you know, thirty six thousand dollars a year, it's three thousand dollars a month expense plus whatever maybe some of the uh, employment, you know, let's call it another seven eight yep. percent. So it might be uh, what is that thirty two hundred dollars, thirty three hundred dollars mm-hmm. um, a month that they then bill to you as yep. a line item, but it essentially covers that person's salary, yep. right? Yep. Salary and so benefits. property manager and leasing agents and anybody else who's working on the property on a full time basis. Is typically done that way. Yep, yep. And so that, so the, it's not really that. It's not simple. You can't say, well, how much is management per unit? Because when I when I call them and I say, hey, I've got this property in rural Kentucky. They have to hire someone. There's nobody else to split it with. Yep. Um, so that's kind of on me. Yep. And so, so your collective say, cost, if you're paying just five percent in management fees, mm-hmm. what is that covering? Um, that's their fee for managing the employees and um, their bookkeeping, the software, reporting, uh, reporting. If the if the stuff. employee quits, needs to be fired, something like that, they're handling the human resources side yeah, of kicking they, them out, they find bringing new, somebody else yep, in, right? find someone else, all yeah. that good stuff, and so. So it's more of a, yeah, it's almost more of like a management asset management 
uh, because the, the site level people are doing like the, the day-to-day property management. And I think yep. you brought up a good point is depending on the size of the building, you know, you About can't say, more. yeah, you can't say your total expense for property management is, hey, the fee plus the salary, let's call it eight or 10%. Mm-hmm. If it's a 60 unit building and it's rural and they can't uh, take that, that cost of the salary and divide it across a couple different properties, they have to put it all on your property. You might be paying 12, 15% total cost. Yep. Uh, same thing with the size of the building. Um, you know, I, I own over a thousand doors in, in one town in Georgia mm-hmm. and they managed for me for two and a half percent, you know? Nice. And so that's beneficial because I can bring the volume there as yep. opposed to, you know, a 48 unit apartment building I might have somewhere else and they say, hey, I need a six or eight percent management fee, you yep. know? Yep. Because of that. So, and understanding uh, it might be a small enough building where, I don't know, maybe it's 20 units and it doesn't justify a full time person. And maybe it isn't a major city, but they might charge an 8% fee, mm. uh, but then there's no salary. Correct. Yep. Right? So, understanding the size of the building, where the building's located, the vintage of the building, um, and what the resources are locally in that area, I think are all important pieces, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, so, so, uh, Property management company, third party versus, uh, and, and you're underwriting it with what? Typically 5% plus the, the salaries? Yeah, so yeah, depend, whatever the scenario is. But if I'm looking at a 50 unit, I'm like, okay, let's, let's plug in half of a salaried uh, manager here. So 5% of my gross income plus whatever it is. Yeah. Half of whatever the salary is in that area. Right. So. And you get and that information, get you, what, from the management company, yeah, I assume, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So How you can contact that? your management what is, company. What does it cost to get good employee here yeah oh here it is all right well half that plus some benefits or whatever and then um, yeah so yeah and then uh you know subject to change salaries go up COVID happens let's talk about that what what's happened over the past couple of years how has your underwriting changed since interest rates have gone crazy yeah COVID occurs uh inflation occurs so Mm -hmm. job costs are going up and employer costs are going up like how are you underwriting for that kind of an environment? Like, how can you, yeah. like, what are you looking for as you underwrite with the change in interest rates, with the change in all these different kinds of costs? Insurance has gone bananas, That's right? It. Yeah, I at least it. where I am. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't gotten any quotes on anything big lately. So, but um, yeah, so it's like uh, usually I'll, I'll I'll plug everything in, and then I'll uh, where where I used to plug in. Uh, five percent interest i'm plugging in eight yep and i go oh crap this thing's not going to cash flow like it was uh 12 months ago if if i would have bought the same property and so that's like it's just it's a it's a it's a deal killer right now because like i was looking at us i was underwriting a 61 unit the other day in tennessee and it was like i think it was like let's say it was a three million dollar purchase price and i was like well this would have been a great deal last year, but now I'm plugging all this in. And even if my stabilized income, I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, I'm going to spend $3 million on this property, but it's only going to cash flow like $50,000 a year. Do I really want to? And that's, that's after two years. And then we don't know what interest rates are going to be like in two years. And then, okay, am I going to be able to refinance it? Am I, you know, am I going to be yeah. able to sell it at this price? We don't know. Price is going to fall. Hopefully not. They will, they'll have to some, but are they going to go in the toilet? And so those are all like the fears that I'm having right now. And so how do you mitigate some of those risks? What are some of the things that you're doing in order to, you know, I guess, yeah, <clears throat> reduce the level of risk that you take on when you're looking at these deals, right? If something that, that maybe was a, a six cap before, mm-hmm. yep. Uh, now you need to buy it at what? An eight cap? Yeah. Maybe, a 10 yeah. cap? A nine? Like, yep. it, do you go based off of like a differential of where interest rates are or where cap rates are versus what you want to buy it at? With it. Say it again. So like, let's say something uh, stabilized. I'll give uh-huh. you an example. Like when I was buying uh, apart, like value add apartment buildings, yeah, 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 I would go and look at a property that uh, I knew that I could go refinance it at, yep. I don't know, Five percent interest rate. Yep. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if I can get it at a five percent interest rate, mm-hmm. 
or if I can get a 5% interest rate when I go to refinance, yep. I need to be all in and it needs to perform at an eight cap oh, right. for yeah, me so personally. All that money so now and, I can yeah. then go refinance mm -hmm. and my refi would be enough even if I got 75% you know, of that valuation would be enough mm -hmm. to pay off all my costs that I'm yeah, yeah, into yeah. this thing for yep. um, because it put me in a position where there was enough of a delta, right? Between yep. what the market cap rate was yep. and what my What's personal, what I was all into it for. And I think yeah, that's yeah. a that's a, a question for a lot of people is like, what is a cap rate? Like, how does that change? And mm -hmm. I, I think there's the market cap rate, which is what are properties in the area yep. uh, selling for? What mm -hmm. are investors buying properties in the area for? And a cap rate's really just a return on investment. It's if I bought this property with all cash, mm -hmm. And it's a million dollar property and it nets $60,000 a year. That's a 6% cap rate. Yep, yep. Uh, well, that's 60% that's 60, that's 60 at what I'm buying it for, right? Yep. Maybe the market is a 5% cap rate. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, for that deal, it would be worth more than a million dollars because right. it's at a five cap and I'm buying it at a 6% cap rate. So yep, yep. there's the cap rate that the market dictates of what things would potentially appraise for. Mm -hmm. And then there's what are you all into it for and what kind of yield does it return to you yeah, yeah, yeah. On, your, on your net operating income and what is that cap rate? It's essentially your ROI yeah, on yeah, the yeah. deal. And so for me, when I was doing a lot of the value add stuff, it was like I wanted to make sure that the market cap and my cap rate, mm -hmm. there was at least like a 25 to 3% delta. Yeah, yeah. And that worked out. Okay. Now, the market's changed a lot. You yeah. know, it's, it's obviously very, very different. It's still hot. Buyers aren't willing to come up. Sellers aren't really willing to come down. Interest yep. rates have risen. So yeah, how yeah. are you navigating that environment? Are you... Um, Complete paralysis. Yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, just not doing shit. No, Waiting like, for honestly, things to change. yeah, I'm like, I, have, I, bought a, I bought a storage facility, my storage facilities that I bought three, prop, three different locations, 160 units. And the only reason I bought it was because it was like, it was a really, really good deal. I bought it with all cash and... Um, like I'm not gonna finance it, um, and I and I'm hoping to sell it in the next like six months. Depends yeah. on how fast I can fill it up. Well, I think but, it, um, I think it ends up depending on your cost of capital. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, you got your own cash, and you could say, hey, if I put my money down, or if I go get a bank loan, mm -hmm. I'm gonna pay the bank. I don't know what's called eight eight percent. Yeah, eight ish. Yeah. Well, shit, I'm okay getting 8% of my own money, mm -hmm. right? Let me just put my own money down, yep. and then I don't have a bank, yep. and I can pay myself as the as the lender yeah. on this thing, yeah, well, passive we're income. Yeah, return, right? And then, right, and yeah. now I'm making essentially 8%, and does that make sense? Yeah, yep. it still makes sense. Yep. Or yep. can you go raise private money yep. at 8% and not have to deal with the bureaucracy of a bank or some yep. lending institution and just work with an individual investor? Yep, yep. And you say, hey, listen, you can come in. I'll give you a note. I'll give you a mortgage on this thing, mm -hmm. assuming they're going to bankroll the whole thing. Yep. Um, yep. And and I'll pay you 8%. So I'm always looking at where else can I get my cost of capital lower? Yeah. And maybe it's with my own cash, like what you did on that deal. Yep. Yep. Maybe it's with a passive, like hard money lender who writes the whole check. Or maybe you're syndicating the capital amongst many different investors and you create a syndication that then... Um, and they're okay making 8%. Yep. And maybe it's a flat 8%. Maybe it's 8% and they own 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of the deal yep. in addition yep. to that. And if that gets the deal done, or maybe you can say, hey, I'll pay you guys 4%, uh -huh. lowers the cost of capital, and I'll give you a 30% ownership in the deal, where yep. now it, it, redu it increases yeah, their... Yeah, uh, they get some upside Yeah, as and well. so, so But that lowers the cost of capital for the deal, which now yeah. makes a lot makes many more deals more favorable to what, what could make sense in this yeah. kind of an interest rate environment. Yeah, the other thing yeah. would be yeah, so seller been, financing. Yeah, I've been learning a lot from you guys on that. Like, honestly, the I joined your mastermind group and you, you came to the this real estate event uh, here in Charleston at the Palmetto Brewing and you were like, yeah. you were like hey, here's, here's what we're doing right now. We're writing three offers on every property. We're writing a, a youth, uh, owner finance, yep. uh, the whole thing, the other yep. one was like something else, and then the lowest one was gonna be, we bring all the cash and yep. cash you out, but like, you're like, yeah, we're throwing like two, uh, 
two percent interest at them and stuff. And not that they're going to take that, yeah. but it's going to open up a conversation to, well, yeah, maybe they do want to get five percent on their capital for yep. five years or something, and then. Um, so yeah, it's, just, it's they don't know what to do with it, man. Like, like, yeah. what are they going to do? They're going to take it out and put it into some other asset that they're not familiar with, or they're yeah, going to put it out, market. put it into the stock market, which is fucking the crazy variable with yep. the banks, like stable banks, like are are have stock prices that are dropping and increasing by 30, 40, 50 percent on a daily basis yeah. because of of all the craziness, like the tech businesses drop by 30 to 60 percent across the board. Um, yeah, it's nuts right now. Like, wh where, what else are they going to do with their money? Yep. And so, for them to have a level of comfortability with that property, yep. and you just come in and say, hey, you're already comfortable with it, right? If I gave you your money, you're going to put it in a bank account that maybe you earn, you know, even if you put in a CD, maybe you make three, four, five percent, mm -hmm. uh, maybe. Or you could sell or finance and I'll pay you 5% or 6% or 4% mm -hmm. and give you some cash down, get you your purchase price. And then when the market kind of rebounds and stabilizes again, then I'll refinance and get you the rest of your money in, you know, 60 to 120 months. And I always say 60 to 100, I talk in months because yeah. it sounds a lot less than five to 10 years. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, it just sets a different parameter and sets a different... Uh, uh, perspective, I guess I would say, in, okay, uh, like in the that. seller's head. So um, if you're not familiar with seller finance, actually, here's a quick plug. Go to the Facebook Creative Finance, uh, Commercial Real Estate Creative Finance with Tim Bratz. Go and plug into that. We try to do lives in there uh, a couple times a month talking about different deals, how we're creatively structuring and financing stuff. So it's free. Just jump in there anytime. Um, well, that's awesome, man. Well, dude, I'm excited to check out your course. Yeah, uh, learn thanks. a little bit more about the, the nitty gritty, right? Like I'm, I'm more of a high level guy. Here's the big picture. Uh, but, and the team really does a lot of the deep dive on, on the um, analytics and the data side and the underwriting side. Yep, uh, yep. I like to see the high level of it, but um, I think it's really, really important to understand that component. And even if you're not um, a finance expert, mm -hmm. just understand the numbers, understand how it flows, understand the different dynamics of, of each of the numbers and how they can either adversely or positively impact the bottom line. And if you get that, then um, you can do as many deals as you want. It's one of those really, really important skill sets on uh, investing in businesses or investing in commercial real estate or any rental real estate really at all. Yep. And uh, you get that, it's a... Uh, uh, it's, it's one of those skills that transcends markets and doesn't matter what's happening in the economy. You figure that piece out. You can do deals regardless of what the economy looks like. Yep. So appreciate you being here, brother. Thank you, Tim. Hey, hopefully you got some good takeaways from that. If you have any other questions or comments, I'd love to hear it in the comment section below. Ask whatever you got and, and I'll make sure I connect with Paul or maybe if I can answer the question. Uh, deliver as much value as I possibly can on future videos. And if you would, please like the video, subscribe, share it with anybody else who you know is working on underwriting apartments. And if you want to learn from Paul about how he underwrites and exactly what that process looks like and the Excel spreadsheet and all that stuff, log into Legacy Wealth Academy. It's a digital library of master classes all about real estate, investing, business scaling, and all things wealth building and wealth preservation. So it's nine bucks a month. And it is a ton, a ton of value all about helping you be more, do more, give more, and have more. So check that out. We'll put that in the show notes below. And until next time, I'll see you on Spill the Beans.